like to say hello and welcome back to everybody who's either entered the room or entered uh, the live stream. So this is a warm welcome. And this is the second part of today and actually uh, the last part of the whole conference. So we would like to make it great. And to really do that, I think uh, a time comes uh, to have a little bit of a uh, summary of what's been told. We've always been surrounded by some great international experts. And one of them uh, has just moderated his debate. But uh, our chairman, the chairman of the IDUB experts team and the president of the Denmark's Foundation for Nature, uh, has hosted another debate uh, yesterday, and today he is back uh, to just really uh, wrap it up uh, with the whole conference and, and share uh, the conclusions. So, Professor Loritz Holm Nielsen, great to have you, and thank you again. Yes. One of our panelists who will take a seat uh, next to uh, Professor Holm Nielsen is Dr. Siebold Norda, who is the member of the IDUB experts team, president of the Magna Charta Observatory uh, from the Netherlands, Amsterdam, if I'm not mistaken, uh, our host uh, as well. Yesterday he, he hosted uh, one of the debates. He was the moderator. Great to have him. And please be so kind and just uh, take into consideration uh, that uh, this applause would also uh, be applied to our uh, fellow panelists. So I'd like to tell you that they're all joining us at the very same moment. We've been here before at 8 a.m. Uh, to make sure that everything will work properly. And so right now, I'm so glad to tell you uh, that uh, also very well known to you, Professor Ulrike Beisigel, the member of our team and former president of the University of Göttingen, is joining us live from Germany. Hello. Hi. Great to see Hello. you again. And so I see quite a change of the scenery <laughs> because you indeed are at your wonderful balcony, aren't you? Yes, I am. That's a good place. I know. Uh, so. The big change, actually, and I'm not speaking of university, I'm not trying to be professional in here, is that today is probably the, the last day of the, the real summer. So in, in Warsaw, it's 29 degrees. I, I hear that the weather is also great in Germany, uh, but tomorrow uh, it's going to be like 19. So that's quite a shift. So please use the balcony uh, as long as possible. Uh, maybe uh, Professor Simon Gaskell would also consider that. Hello. Good to have you back. Hello. I, I, I don't have a balcony to, to, um, to sit bad. on, but I do have a very nice uh, English country garden, which I'm looking out over now. Oh, wonderful. So that's, uh, that's uh, good as well. Thank you for joining us. And uh, our uh, next uh, team member, uh, also distinguished and appreciated, Professor Josef Palinkas, a former president of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Good to have you back, Professor. Good to be back. Of course. And uh, I will be uh, leaving the stage uh, to our great moderator, Professor Loritz Holm Nielsen. Thank you so much again. Thank you. And thank you to my fellow uh, uh, members of the international team. I'm looking very much forward to having a, an exchange of reflections based on these two <coughs> days of, uh, of discussions. Um, and first, I would of course, I think I should congr congratulate our uh, uh, Polish uh, colleagues from all the universities and, and also from the scientific community and the ministry for what you have achieved. Um, I, I think we should remind ourselves that Poland, for maybe the last 25 years, has taken steps back and forth in a process towards what we may, might call a modernization of, of a, a huge science, technology, and higher education sector in Poland. It's seen from abroad, it's a, it was a highly compartmentalized sector, uh, and uh, 
even within individual universities, the activities were so highly uh, compartmentalized, so no one could expect efficiency. And um, if I should just um, remind myself of the, what has happened since I participated in the EU um, review of the sector four years ago only, um, I think that the tone of the debate debate has changed from minor to major or from resignation or into optimism and trust in future. I feel when I hear all of you also during coffee breaks and, and your statements, of course everybody speaks with one's own voice, but I sense a different tone. Uh, and it's only in four years that this has changed, and I think it's probably um, a, a major um, um, a step forward for you all, because you can do so much more when you are in an optimistic mode and when you look ahead in something where you know you can change the situation to the better. Uh, we, from the panel, we recommended to the minister, Govin, uh, last year that it would be good and beneficial for the whole EDU program to, ha to have a non-intrusive monitoring along the road. And what we had in mind what not, was not to have constant evaluation and constant collection of data and in a sense the build up of a bureaucracy that might take out the good spirit of the whole program. And so this is the first uh, attempt to have a, um, a non-intrusive monitoring of the system. It, it, a monitoring or a way of, of following what is going on that creates an open space for all of you where you can exchange good and bad experiences. And I think we have seen um, very good uh, steps in that direction. So I don't want to speak for half an hour now because we want to have exchange with the audience uh, later on. So before I, I give the floor to my four colleagues, I, I want to just provide you all with two observations. And I, as you know, sometimes what I say is just as I see it. Um, but before I come with my two observations, I think we should all recognize that this is not a process with a constant speed, uh, not for the whole EDUP program and not for the individual universities. You would see sometimes things happen at, at a rather um, high speed, at, at other times it looks like if nothing happens. This is the nature also of uh, biological systems. They don't develop uh, at a constant speed um, so this is not how uh, nature is. So in biological systems, uh, the physical time scale is probably not the right kind of time scale because uh, in biology it's more about events, an opportunity to mate, an opportunity to seed, and this is not something that comes every five minutes. It comes when uh, the sun and the moon is in the right position. <laughs> um, but I have two observations. One of them is that if I look across the 20 universities, some of them, some of you have taken on the EDO opportunity and it's in the process of integrating it into your daily practices. Others have taken the EDO as a project and has created a specific unit somewhat outside of the daily practices of the university like a, an appendix and I would, it's an observation on my part and on my question mark is these are two different ways of operating the EDUP and I have my, have my personal doubts that is the right way to go to create this appendix situation because it's very easy to cut off an appendix and everything at the end will continue as it used to be. So this was one observation and of course we can discuss it, maybe it's not a correct observation. The one, other one is um, I have observed that my own
three uh, conceptions um, have not all been correct. I had the idea that, that in one of the major cities, ever, all the, the roadmap towards a real merger of already strong universities into a, a stronger university was laid out and it was just a matter of when it would happen. Now I think that the steps taken in that city, uh, I, I'm not shy so I can tell you it's near the Baltic Ocean and it's very beautiful <laughs> and you have worked there. Uh, so, but I think that steps taken, it, they are more timid than I had uh, expected. In another city, which I know well, in the western part of Poland, the expectations were not too high uh, on my part, but it seems like that city is about to run faster in the integration process than in the lovely city at the coast of the Baltic Sea. I guess this is just a fact of uh, how opportunities are, but it also tells me that we should never have uh, too strong preconceptions. We should always be open uh, to, see, um, to see the opportunity. And, and this is what I see across the system, across the 20 universities. Some apparently have the opportunities to move a little bit faster than others in this moment. So um, maybe this was more an observation, but it's also a question. Um, should we push harder in some cases? Why, why are you talking about federations when you should be talking or could be talking about real integration and mergers? And you don't need to copy the French because their federations haven't worked in general. So some have, but in general they haven't. It has been kind of superstructure in some of the major cities of France and uh, we don't need superstructures. We need efficient system. So these were my remarks, two observations. Could you move a little bit faster in some cases on the, on the integration of great universities in the same cities? Or, and is it right to try to create these appendix-like uh, uh, administrative units to handle the EDUP or should you rather go for uh, real integration in, in the daily life of the university. And maybe I would now turn on to my colleagues and ask you, each of you, if you have a couple of us observations and, uh, and maybe comments also so we can start our discussion based on that. So uh, back to Hamburg, Ulrike. Yes, thank you, Lawrence. Yeah, first of all, I would really uh, congratulate uh, for a really impressive conference and also a very professional moderation. Thank you very much for that. And the process of uh, the Excellence Initiative, this way of uh, progress review is an important milestone, I think. And uh, to keep all 20 universities in the process uh, is a smart decision. And for that, I really thank Minister Govin and Anna Butsanowska. Uh, and I'm, I was glad to hear that the uh, new ministry is going on in the same path. Uh, let me emphasize uh, that from my own experience in the German initiative, it is, as you all reported, so important to get all the members uh, of the university on board, both the scientific and, and that came out in the last discussion, uh, Ms. Simon, uh, also the members uh, of the administration. And uh, they need to support science, and uh, without that, I think it will not work. We heard that this morning also. So it was very good to see that you all work hard on this particular topic, and I would just motivate you to go on and get everybody on board. The structural changes we have uh, heard about are very prom prom promising. Uh, in a way, and I, I say that now in short, leaving the strong hierarchy and have inclusive teams where next to the experienced professors there are young researchers, international experienced persons and also administrative uh, staff with a new thinking. And uh, to use in those teams also the perspective of young and older females that is, had not been presented very well in the progress reports. 
Major efforts have been presented for early career support and internationaliz internationalization. And I can say I'm not commented all of that, but I hope that all these approaches will be successful and you will be able to recruit many excellent young researchers from Poland and internationally. And uh, Simon, uh, Simon said that you have to find the right balance between gain of new people and retaining of the best of your universities. This balance, I think, is extremely important. I would appreciate if in the early career approaches, we would see more special programs to motivate female students and young females and have them come into research and into scientific careers. I was a little disappointed that there are so few comments in that direction uh, in, the, in the progress reviews and also in the discussion. So I, I think there have to be measures to get the system in Poland uh, also a generally uh, balanced system. And let me mention the communication, the role of communication. You all re reported on the challenge to reach all members in the university. And uh, I really would like to motivate you to use all means, I mean also the so-called new media, uh, to implement um, uh, your ideas in the whole university and have also a good team for inter internal communication. And the other thing certainly is the communication with the society. But uh, I know that it's not easy. And on the other side, information of the society, letting them know what you do is the basis for potential fundraising. And this is, I think, something <coughs> which you should think about. I didn't hear that in any of the reports. Concerning the research priority areas, we know you are supporting these in different ways. Maybe we do not know enough how you support them with your own money. But uh, we all agree on the importance of interdisciplinary cooperation and consortia. And I totally agree. But do not forget that archives, that's how we call it, that means excellent individual researchers who can receive awards like ESC grants are important as well. And in particular, they are important in humanities and social sciences. The research which is mostly not in the focus of the consortia and the big uh, research priority areas. And I think those, res those sciences are important for the future of our society. Even so, I see uh, also due to the pandemic, you all have a very sophisticated I IT concept. However, it would be interesting uh, in the next time to see a bit more of an institutional organ organization for computing uh, like a computing center on science and service in the IT or digital uh, area. Uh, maybe you all have that, but it wasn't a big point. I have learned a lot of changes you already implemented and you have seen, and we have seen very interesting concepts. However, and we all are aware of that, the quality of these organizational changes and as much as the scientific outcome of the, uh, of the priority areas can only come into effect in the next couple of years. And I'm to really eager to see uh, the, the further development. And last, let me mention a point which was not in the focus of most of the presentations. And this is the responsibility of universities to promote the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. I believe that research should be done for these goals and students of all faculties should be trained to think globally for a sustainable de development and uh, for a safe and peaceful future. I hope that can be included in the future in your universities as well. That was my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulrike. Uh, we are not commenting on its other uh, comments yet. Uh, we can take that later on. But I think we should move to the present. And to Joseph, would you uh, uh, come forward with your statement? Yes, uh, thank you, Larich. Um, in my panel, there were uh, five uh, universities which were not selected in the top uh, ten. And um, the panel was about excellence in, in, in research. 
what I uh, noticed and uh, I observed that um, their motivation is uh, there. So they complained a little bit about the um, fact that they uh, were not selected in the uh, first uh, ten or the. Uh, but um, the spirit of these um, five universities is, is still there, and I think that the fact that we having this conference with the 20 universities together is a very good thing, because um, you remember that uh, when we uh, made this uh, selection, there was not a very clear-cut uh, line between these 10 and the other, other 10. So um, I noticed that uh, they are moved in that uh, direction which they have uh, as a priority areas. But I also asked them the question that um, what, um, how did they reallocate their existing funding to focus on the um, on these uh, priority areas, but uh, I didn't get uh, much of an answer on that. They um, mainly emphasized what they uh, did um, in, in research, um, mainly the usual things, um, support uh, publication in, in top quality journals, but I did not uh, really see that uh, they made a real effort to um, recruit uh, new staff. And when I when I asked that, uh, they they again said that uh, this is uh, this is very difficult. Of course, it is very difficult. It's difficult in Hungary, and I guess it's difficult in Denmark or, or in Germany. But um, if if you really want to change, you you really that, that whole change depends on 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 people. Now the other thing, which is a little bit um, touches on what uh, you uh, Larry said about the integration, a large university, uh, they did not really um, uh, elaborate what they um, are trying to do to uh, integrate those um, universities uh, in, in Lodz. So my um, main observation that for these um, universities who were uh, at the uh, so-called runner-up uh, phase, for them the motivation is there and the spirit is there and this is uh, it, that we certainly have to mention in our report and uh, then uh, the whole exercise um, um, of um, excellence initiative is uh, very valuable because uh, this um, makes these universities to do some uh, self-reflection but the um, the motivation is very much concentrated about uh, about the more funding and um, what I I would um, say as a, as a negative uh, aspect that um, they regard it as a, as a way of get more funding so they should concentrate uh, on this project as a more as an opportunity to, to change the structure and also to, to change the way they are um, um, selecting staff and they are recruiting uh, people. So um, to, to sum it up, uh, I think that uh, these um, five universities, uh, they really want to um, uh, go for the for the in, in the next round to go for uh, to to get into the so-called uh, first uh, league. Although I don't like that uh, word because uh, they are in the same league, so to say. Uh, but they are quite 
a big difference is between uh, their uh, their approach. So, if I, well, without mentioning uh, specifically any of of these universities, there were definitely two groups. One, which was um, going faster, and uh, the other to the other group, which. Um, is waiting to to get uh, funded uh, to um, um, to get uh, restructuring and get a different mode of uh, of uh, operation. So um, and and finally, just uh, make a comment on Ulrich's uh, comment. Uh, yeah, I I haven't seen any uh, any effort. Uh, to um, really um, recruit uh, female scientists, and uh, they they don't have uh, that kind of thinking that they have to provide uh, uh, jobs for for the husband or the uh, or the wife if they want to recruit people from from abroad. We I guess uh, have to point that out. And that's it. Cool. Thank you very much, Joseph. And I think we should move to Amsterdam, which happens to be right here next to me, Seibold. Thank you very much, Lorid. Um, um, I'd like to, um, to make a couple of observations on the, um, the general process um, of this initiative and this exercise. And first of all, um, both when reading the materials that we were sent and witnessing what has been shared uh, yesterday and today, I um, observed um, a high degree of optimism um, and um, a sentiment um, that was telling us um, yes, we can do what we want to reach. We can move forward towards the goals that um, we set ourselves. And that mood of optimism and of um, um, engagement and committed commitment, um, um, I read as a very positive sign. Um, it's quite a difference from the atmosphere you see in many university gatherings all around the world where there is an atmosphere either of complacency, uh, we are excellent and the only problem is that the rest of the world still is waiting uh, to accept, um, uh, or um, a, um, uh, a sentiment of uh, cynicism um, where again the academic world is very self-certain um, but is complaining all the time about the, um, um, the response it does not get. Here, um, there was um, a good mix of optimism and a sentiment of we can do. And that is, I think, um, a very welcome kind of observation in the, um, um, in the stage of development the whole process is in. And this is also something where individual universities and individual um, academics working within individual universities have the advantage of um, benefiting from the um, successes and the mood of their peers. Uh, to have a conference like this with all 20 participating universities in the same role is a very important sign that to move forward, it is great to not be alone in moving forward. And it also means that you're not alone in um, um, mastering the uh, disadvantages, overcoming hurdles, and maybe even in the future, um, having the need to stand together um, to, um, to fight dangers and risks that might um, endanger the progress of the whole process. Having said that, I would like to um, remind us 
of a couple of risks and challenges. First of all, like I said yesterday morning, processes like this one take time. Nothing substantial is going to happen within one year or two years or three years. And for this kind of change to really take root, you have to keep your energy level um, very high over a period of at least seven or eight years. So there, there should not be a drop in engagement, a drop in energy levels um, too soon. Um, otherwise, we run the risk of losing what has been accomplished uh, so far. A second risk I see uh, is the risk of um, fading political support. Uh, the whole initiative um, has benefited from strong political support until the very day. But we all know about politics. It is hard to predict. Um, and it, you must um, really entertain the possibility that political support will be fading. And I would like to, to speak to the political representatives, but also to the universities themselves, <clears throat> that it is absolutely essential that this political support also stays at the same energy level it started out on. Uh, there will be obstacles in the years to come, and then again, that support is absolutely crucial. Same thing about internal leadership. Most universities have seen a change in their institutional leadership in the last couple of months. And uh, we all know that it is not uncommon that new leaders rather make their own plans then continue the good plans of their predecessors. In this case, that would be absolutely very sad if that would happen. What is absolutely essential for the process to go on and for all these 20 universities to move on on the path they have chosen is that new leadership makes the existing plan and the existing challenges and strategies uh, their own and treat them not as something invented by someone else for their, before their times but as something that they are committed to themselves and will be engaged in themselves. This is not a kind of personal planning of a generation of leaders. This is about a real important cultural change for the institution. And if leaders are to be important to their institutions, they should take that long vision and be responsible agents of this existing program um, in their own terms. And last but not least, we sometimes talk about this process as a process of modernizing university. To my taste, that is not enough, because there are many modern universities around the world that are more theaters of individual careers and competitions than anything else. I know of many universities worldwide that have very little in common, that have an academic community that is more thinking in terms of parallel careers than in terms of um, joint values, shared purposes, and um, being driven by the very same mission. And I would wish that this modernizing process of the leading universities in Poland is also a process leading to modern universities in the sense of universities being responsive to society's needs, to the world's needs, Ulrike mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, um, and to be responsible universities. Responsible not just for their own existence and their own future, and for that of their graduates, their students, 
and their staff, but also um, responsible for society at large. Because at the end of the day, political support, societal support, and the success of universities changing in a dramatic way depends on their being perceived as responsible institutions to the benefit of mankind and in special uh, mankind in their own region and their own country. So I wish that this particular modernizing uh, movement um, stays within the realms of responsive and responsible universities rather than universities as theaters of individual careers and competitions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sim uh, <laughs> Seibold. And over to London, uh, Simon. Thank you very much, Lloyds. Um, I will try and make some comments which, which complement um, what our colleagues have, have said rather than duplicate them, because I agree with much of, of what has been said. Let me begin by saying that I think over the last two days we've heard about some great developments um, across the range of universities who have been uh, represented. I think the conference is an excellent mechanism uh, for sharing ideas in a, um, a collaborative spirit, uh, though I note, of course, the limitations of, of virtual and that um, the exchanges that often take place over a coffee over, or over lunch uh, are often as valuable about, uh, more valuable than uh, what one learns from formal sessions. The issue of collaboration, I think, is an important one. Uh, all universities across the world, I think, uh, struggle with achieving the right balance between collaboration and competition. My, my personal view is that um, uh, in England we don't have that balance quite right at the moment, uh, and I use England rather than the UK advisedly because there are different systems in, in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. But the English balance is at present too far, in my view, in the direction of, of competition. But I simply make the point that achieving that appropriate balance between competition, which is inevitable and appropriate, and collaboration is, is a, a difficult one to achieve, but conferences such as this, I think, are very helpful in, in making sure there is an appropriate um, sharing of ideas. In terms of what we've heard over the last two days, I think, two days, uh, I think it's unsurprising that the progress reports should primarily have concerned uh, the development of plans um, and the uh, recounting the expenditure of, of money. Future conferences, of course, might be expected to focus more on, on achievements. And I think it's worth unpicking that idea just a little bit. I, I was amused, but also recognized, uh, Seibold's um, anecdote yesterday about talking to a colleague uh, concerning the development of a new strategy, and the colleague said, is it a plan or are we, are we going to do it? Uh, I think many of us will recognize uh, that sentiment. Indeed, uh, a decade or so ago, it was common in the UK for universities to have strategic plans that invariably committed the university to achieving uh, international prominence or international status, but rarely indicated how you could tell. In other words, it was an objective where the universities couldn't fail because how do you define what international status is? It is a single collaboration with a foreign university, is it a, a particular ranking in a league table or, or whatever? So these things need defining. Uh, when I was president of Queen Mary University of London, I induced, introduced the idea, uh, which was novel at the time, of including in strategic plan objectives that were measurable and, and contestable. Now that was a bit controversial at the time, but it made the, had the uh, enormously important effect of engaging colleagues. They recognized that this was not just a plan, but it was something that we were going to do. And I would commend that approach to our um, Polish colleagues uh, while recognizing the force of the argument of the comments you made, Lawrence, about the importance that um, setting targets should not become, if you like, an industry in itself and become too intrusive. That must be avoided. Uh, and I also recognize Seibold's um, comment that many of the changes that are um, planned and, and uh, aimed for under the IGIB scheme uh, will take time. So we should not set unrealistically short-term uh, objectives. Nevertheless, I think we will need to know in five years' time what success for the scheme and for the individual universities 
will look like. Lois, you already made some comments about um, mergers and, and federations, uh, and we've heard of different approaches during uh, this conference. We also heard, interestingly, a very strong defense from uh, the Medical University of Bialystok um, in favor of uh, smallness, small size, and, and, and the, um, as I understood the argument, the agility that comes with, with, with a modest size. I think myself that there were still compelling arguments for um, mergers or at least very close collaborations between institutions, but I do recognize the force of the argument that you mustn't create some uh, administrative monolith in so doing and therefore lose the agility. And so that's another balance that I think universities need to achieve. Um, the economies of scale and the academic benefits that derive from a larger institutional federation without um, sacrificing institutional uh, agility. I was also struck, um, I think it was in the same session, to hear from the rector of Roxlav University of Science and Technology, who didn't quite say um, that they were grateful not to have received the 10%, uh, but did um, express the rather strong view that the shock to the system of not being in the top 10 was significant and ultimately constructive in forcing some new imaginative thinking um, within the university. And indeed, that designation in the second group rather than the first group had been a very useful stimulus to internal discussion. Uh, Aside from the particulars of, uh, of that university, I think that's a very interesting illustration of, of how even not getting the top prize, if you like, in this competition has led to very beneficial effects in stimulating discussion, stimulating um, real uh, priority setting within, within universities. Despite what I said um, about the benefits of large organizations whilst retaining agility, I think it's been pleasing that we haven't heard too much um, about structural reorganizations within universities in the last two days. I have always taken perhaps the slightly cynical view um, that in universities all structures get in the way um, and the best structures get in the way least. Um, I think our, our anarchist colleague yesterday might, might approve of that sentiment. And of course, it is a, 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 an intentional overstatement of, of my view, but it's intended to emphasize that what we must achieve um, is an empowerment of individual researchers and their teams, not an imposition of, of, um, of formalities. So I think all structural reorganizations, structural adjust adjustments should, should bear that in mind. I think it's, it's been a little surprising to me, at least, that there hasn't been more discussion over the last couple of days about the effect of the pandemic, although obviously that has meant that um, not all of us have been able to attend uh, in, in person. Uh, I think we heard from um, uh, AMU yesterday that, that uh, there was a benefit to research of the pandemic in that um, uh, academics were not distracted by their teaching. I have to say that I was surprised by that. Um, in that the concern amongst British universities has been quite in the opposite direction in that academics have been diverted into, into transfer of their teaching materials online and to developing new um, approaches to, to digital learning. And that has detracted from their research interest. And worse than that, there have been significant effects on the careers of um, uh, early career researchers who have been on, uh, who were on, fixed term contracts and in many cases their con those contracts have been terminated. So there is in the UK a very serious concern uh, about the pipeline of, of uh, early career researchers as a result of the effects of the pandemic. Uh, as I say, I, if, if that is not the case in Poland then I think that's terrific um, but I was a little bit surprised there was not more uh, discussion um, about that. Finally I, I, I think um, that the comments that have been received in the last or made in the last couple of days, um, in, including the input, I hope, from the, um, uh, the international team have, have been helpful. I hope that um, universities will embrace the notion of input from other institutions within Poland and well beyond 
as part of the development of their own universities. And that takes me back to where I came in, where, which is, I think, that the spirit of collaboration uh, can be and should be uh, extraordinarily productive. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, if, if I listen well to my colleagues, we have many things we could discuss, but we only have 15 minutes, so we have to be a little bit selective. Um, I think it's worthwhile to take a, a, a short round on the, uh, how our take is on this uh, pandemic, uh, the crisis that has followed, uh, is following, developing uh, in relation to the pandemic even though it, it's kind of, it's a precondition for how the EDUP will develop. But nevertheless, maybe we should take a short round on that and then return to some of the major issues uh, that was raised directly um, in relation to the sense of uh, the excellence program. So I, I would invite my colleagues for short comments to uh, how do you think that the, the um, COVID-19 will influence uh, the development of uh, the research universities, in this case in Poland? Short comments and then in a few minutes we'll move on to the next question. I'm looking at Seibold because he's, he's the only one I can see. Uh, so therefore, I will ask him if... if if, do you have any comments or observations vis-a-vis -vis the, the COVID um, you want to make now? And then we can pass uh, the microphone to one of the other colleagues. Well, if we, if, we, if we think about consequences of the present pandemic in terms of the present process, uh, of course, the, the main negative impact will be on uh, international mobility. Um, I mean, in, in many of the, um, of the uh, development plans that we reviewed last year, there was foreseen um, a, a high degree of international mobility, of colleagues coming to spend time in Poland, um, Polish uh, young researchers and established researchers to do part of their work elsewhere, uh, to have a, a dense sort of traffic back and forth in many different fields. And all of that will either have to be postponed, so that's one of those reasons why we need time to work for us, or be replaced by collaborations in other modes. The only relief or consolation there is that in the present pandemic, we are all wearing the same hats. Universities in all countries are facing exactly the same problem, which means that the, um, the energy spent on finding um, replacement modes and do e-meetings, do collaborations on screen, um, work on workshops in different styles, um, that is, those are endeavors shared um, by all, and it would be important um, that the 20 universities um, that are represented here um, are actively participating in those um, uh, new modes of collaboration. And um, at the same time, keeping in mind um, the, um, the um, uh, objectives of the strategy plan and maybe hope for times uh, where um, the um, in-person mobility will return to, um, to levels that we have known before. Thank you, Seibold. Um, maybe do you have any comments from, uh, from, the, from Hungary, uh, Joseph? Yeah, just uh, two short um, comments. Um, it, uh, the pandemic has a, a negative effect on, uh, on mobility, that's uh, absolutely clear. But um, interestingly, uh, in, in the panel, it was uh, mentioned that um, the universities has to develop their um, online teaching and their digital uh, teaching or whatever you call it. So uh, it uh, will help them to make, it, make their courses in English because they have to compete with um, 
are well known international courses. So um, the English language teaching in, in Poland uh, might even uh, benefit from uh, from this uh, thing. That that, that was uh, definitely mentioned in the in the panel. Thank you. Maybe Ulrike, do you have a comment? Um, not so much. I mean, I, I have a problem with the computer. I'm now on my iPhone, but I guess you can still hear me. Um, I think it's important that uh, the universities are aware of the fact that even due to the pandemic, there's a lot of um, virtual communication and that has to be perfect, as we already heard. But uh, as much as possible, they should also try to, uh, to have the students um, present because I think education and the university cannot only be digital. So I know that it's difficult here in Germany, but it's also, I guess, difficult there that you find the right balance between having uh, the students in, uh, in the university with all the uh, protection measures uh, and not only um, uh, virtual education. I, I have some observations myself. First of all, it's very early to say anything. There's no research uh, on, 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 on this subject at all. At the moment, there's a lot of comments and lots of people uh, make themselves interesting. I think many of, our, of the researchers of higher education uh, have comments, but they don't have any experience in it. Uh, we are not listening enough to uh, the younger people that are having uh, wearing the hat so therefore I'm personally looking forward to what is coming out of the Marie Curie alumni uh, survey which is uh, going on at the moment because these are young researchers all over Europe and they will uh, they they are facing the music so to speak um, I know from my own university and our own setting in Denmark that uh, several things happens uh, the universities, they, are, they have been forced, I guess, to differentiate much more uh, in their practices. So, for example, they, they are prioritizing on-campus education for the youngest students. Uh, they are prioritizing on-campus um, activities for those people who uh, um, are dependent on uh, laboratory facilities and so on. So, so it's not, they are not uh, using like the one size fits all um, attitude to the different challenges uh, they are. And of course they have to obey the rules of the game when there's too many infections in, uh, near one university, that university will have to, to limit uh, activities. But there's another observation I have. I have seen that some of the, um, in this case, private foundations that are funding research activities, they have um, um, a, a adopted a very cynical attitude. They don't want to extend grants for, let's say, young researchers in fixed-term positions that that claim that they have uh, their um, research activities, for example, have suffered. So if they say, oh, we, ha we are four uh, months behind, we need four months more, uh, in a grant that covers four months more. And, and uh, some of the foundations, they have, they have actually said, no, you have to finish within time. It, it sounds cynical, but, and maybe this will change when, when Everybody knows more about the situation, but I guess my best um, advice is to, to, to observe what is happening, learn, try to be open, talk to people, in your colleagues in other countries, figure out what they are doing, and, and see whether you can adapt some of the be good practices they have and maybe share experiences, because in a few years we will know the effect uh, of, of uh, this pandemic. But I, I, I'm afraid I have to say, as a biologist, I guess we will get pandemics at a faster pace in the future. Because the one of the 17, we had missed an goal number, number zero. Uh, the reason why all the 17 uh, UN goals are here is actually that we are too many people in this planet. And, and this is the too political too sensitive to talk about. So even the UN has not 
a policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis that. They claim that uh, we have not passed 10 billion people in my lifetime, and, and thanks for that, but I'm, I'm not sure it's right. And, um, and, and the reason why all resources, all political systems, everything is under such a pressure is that we are too many people, and this is something we can't discuss. And so therefore, biology takes care of the problem, and one, uh, we know that from nature. Uh, too, if there are too many organisms in one uh, niche, uh, it, it, we get what in human society is called a pandemic. So we'll get more pandemics. So we have to live it, with it, and we have to figure out how to use uh, resources or technologies and other things to cope with it. But the COVID-19 is not the last pandemic. That's 100% sure. Um, Simon, you got some comments yes, from your Lawrence. four colleagues. What, what would you say? <laughs> Well, a, a couple of points. I was actually going to make, uh, in a sense, the point that you finish with there, that I think everyone has a tendency to say, well, let's live through this pandemic um, and hope it doesn't last too long, um, rather than say, how do we make the, the, the most of it and, and uh, adjust our, our practices? Uh, as you say, for two reasons. The first is we don't know how long this pandemic will last, and the second is, unequivocally, this will not be the last. So we have to deal with this in future and the implications for you know, international mobility. Two, two points, um, two specific points, I think, in relation to that. We heard some interesting comments this morning from the Warsaw University of, of Technology, who said that because of the reductions in mobility and, and the difficulty of following their objectives with respect to visiting professors, they had introduced a, a new category of e-visiting professor which I think is, is an imaginative uh, approach and, and one that might be um, emulated, followed by um, other universities. The second point, I think, is that we can, um, in some cases, might make a virtue out of necessity. Uh, we, we will um, bemoan, we'll be sorry for the lack of um, direct interpersonal connections that we get at, for example, research conferences. And without question, person-to-person um, -person interactions are important. But there is another side to this. One of the observations which I find most interesting about the effects of the pandemic on undergraduate teaching in UK universities is that whereas um, e-learning is often considered to be impersonal, in some universities, the extent of interaction between students, this is undergraduate students, and, and their teachers has increased. And this is attributed to the fact that certainly with the younger generation, they are very comfortable with um, electronic communications, indeed more comfortable, so that the same student who would be very reticent to ask a question uh, of, of a lecturer um, during or at the end of a lecturer is very happy to ask that question online. In the research area, I think this points to an opportunity um, for young researchers in particular to take part in virtual research conferences and to exploit some um, digital communication with which they're very comfortable to access senior researchers and experienced researchers in ways that they're more comfortable with and, and, and happen more, more, more likely than uh, in face-to-face uh, -face conferences. So that's an example, I think, of, of, of making the most uh, of the necessity of restricted international mobility. We all hope that physical mobility will return, but let's make sure that we make use of digital mobility to the benefit, in particular, uh, of young researchers. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, just one final comment on, on, on this from my part, because I have some experiences because of my former job as the director of the Sino-Danish Center in Beijing. All our teaching was actually not uh, there's a lot of on-campus teaching, but all exams were vi virtual uh, between Denmark and China. And, and uh, there was no, absolutely no uh, problems. Lots of meetings between people that were on com campus in Beijing and on the different campuses in Denmark took uh, uh, place like, th like this conference as a mix of uh, virtual and on-site uh, activity. And and what has happened now during the pandemic uh, crisis is that the, the many more
people and also institutions have learned what, what they can do with the technology. And so now everybody understands how, how you can have a, a, a conference uh, or meeting with the 10, 20 people in different places uh, instead of traveling so much. So I think we will travel less uh, for meetings in the past and I, I, I'm personally thankful for that. I think it's a, a lot of the time spent on, on travel just for meeting a couple of hours uh, can be saved. So I guess that all the, my four colleagues and myself, we have explained, uh, expressed our opinions also during the, the panel sessions. So I would think we should go on now to the questions that have, uh, may come from the audience and also electronic uh, uh, questions. And then at the end, we serve five minutes for the five of us maybe to reflect a little bit on what comes next. Um, uh, how do we see th uh, the next stage of uh, non-intrusive uh, um, uh, monitoring of the program? Do we have any observations, anything we would think it could, should, could, should be done in a different way? Uh, some good experiences from this opportunity and, and maybe some further thoughts on, on what we can recommend to our, our uh, Polish uh, colleagues. I, I, should I take this? Sure. Uh, so we, we do have one question from our viewers. I, I just wonder first if we have some questions from uh, the audience uh, that are in here. You do have a question? Okay, so, so uh, you suggest that we first take the, the online question. Uh, Professor Holm Nielsen was one of experts of 2017 you know, uh, EU report on HE in Poland. Uh, does Professor Nielsen see any substantial changes in the system now? In particular, are there any signs for increased mobility of staff or is the career still linear? Study, PhD, habilitation and professorship uh, all at the same university? First of all, I think I, I I have said before that I feel a strong change in, in, in mood uh, from, from a rather defensive situation to an open uh, situation where the whole system is open to change now and, and the, the tone is definitely not minor, it's major. Uh, the, I, in my world, that is a substantial change in, in, in short, a short period period of time, and it's a prerequisite for all the other changes. May I just ask you, Professor, uh, just out of curiosity, how, how do you see that change coming? Like, wh what did you think was the factor causing it? Like, I would think that mentality changes very slow, and it does take time or decades, and, and yet you say you see that. Yeah, I, I guess that such a mood change happens if people feel they can trust uh, a new situation. So one of the reasons for this change is actually that the sector has had a very strong uh, in, in view from the minister, Minister Govan himself. Mm -hmm. He has been the, um, the guard, in a sense, the guarantee that that was, was promised is also delivered. Um, so it, it's a good opportunity that the framework has been as it, as it was promised. When he promised the international team that the government would follow our recommendation, whatever it was, uh, I, mean, we barely, I barely believe that because like Simon and our, the other friends, uh, we have worked in many countries and it's, it's um, it's normal that whenever you have made a priority, um, political arguments are added. It could be regional development or whatever it is. So it's very normal that some political considerations would be added. This didn't happen. 
um, uh, the go government stood by uh, the promise to us, which made our job much more uh, gratifying. Uh, so I think the framework is right. Uh, the government has also, as, as I said yesterday, um, uh, been uh, true to the, uh, to the promise that new fresh resources would follow um, um, the, the change within the new law. So, so far, so good. And the question is, have I observed a change in the mobility within the Polish system? And the, uh, the correct answer is no, because I don't have any numbers. But I have a sentiment that is actually <laughs> happening. And I feel at least that the, the level of, of uh, leadership that we meet, that the openness of, of discussion across the system mm -hmm. it's, 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 is there. So I don't see any, any reason why this mobility should not happen. Um, and it's much more likely to happen because the framework, the, the new law, the, uh, these conditions are right. There's another thing I think we heard this morning from, from uh, Postan, that now all your PhD students have a grant. This was not like that uh, four years ago. I guess you had 10 times as many PhD students as, uh, you, uh, as you could grant. Of course, therefore, there was a huge inefficiency in the system. Many, many PhD students were not full-time PhD students. They were doing a whole lot of other things, which was good for them, but not good for a career, and, and, and it was poison for mobility. Mm -hmm. it, it, if you are a full-time PhD student, it's possible to move to another city when at some point, if you are at 10 percent uh, PhD student and have 90% jobs in the city, you have to give up your jobs, uh, the income of the family to move. So I think that, that uh, we will see this mobility of staff and of course I will encourage everybody to, to, to try to hire uh, some uh, uh, great brains from other Polish and foreign universities and try to to push away the, your best graduates, the best you can do is to push them away to go to good places mm -hmm. where they can become any be, uh, even better and then maybe one day you can recruit them back. Hopefully, hopefully. And I believe uh, Dr. Norda wanted to add something. Yeah, I would like to, to add one thought to the question uh, how to explain this mood change. Um, I may be wrong, but um, I would say that it is also the power of uh, selectivity. Uh, addressing an invited group of 20 universities as a subgroup of all higher education institutions in the country makes these 20 universities realize they are in a special situation and they have a once in a lifetime opportunity to make things better. And the, the power of selectivity, rather than speaking as government, as a minister, only in general terms to the whole system, um, probably translates into this um, mood change. And um, uh, the only thing I would, on a personal note, add to that, that apart from it being important that there is a group of leading research universities in a country, governments should also think about other profiles in higher education institutions yes. that are equally important for a society and for the development of society, in addition to research um, excellence. Uh, but selectivity in itself, speaking to a targeted audience, um, um, has the benefit of receiving a targeted response. Actually, I have two more comments because I, I want to follow on to Simon's comment on, on uh, small, strong universities. And it's part of the whole picture. Of course, a strong higher education system should be diversified. Uh, so you would have strong, maybe strong, big, old universities with which are 
cornerstones for the whole system. But in addition, uh, it's very healthy to have uh, smaller, agile institutions uh, 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 and also institutions with different missions. So the diversification of the system is, is important, but that has, is not run counter to consolidation of the system. Mm -hmm. The other observation was that what we saw uh, during the EU PSRF review was that Poland's uh, higher education and research system was badly in need of um, a, a generational change mm -hmm. um, and uh, badly in need of creating opportunities for the many coming strong, younger uh, uh, Polish uh, uh, scientists and researchers and, and academics. And this is not to blame anybody, it was just a fact of, of, of the situation. And we see clearly now after the new, the election of rectors of, in, in Poland uh, that took place this, this year, that the, the, the generational change is happening at, even at the top level. Uh, of course, this is an indication only, but I have no doubt that this is happening throughout the system. And we are not saying that there should not be, I, and I'm an old person, so I can say, of course, there should also be room for old per people in the system, but, but uh, we should not be like a roadblock for the uh, renovation or the constant um, innovation of the system from uh, using, making best use of the very excellent uh, young brains that are better trained than we were. That's, that's, that's a very considerate approach and I think many people would appreciate that. Uh, speaking of the uh, younger generation, I, I would like to hear from Dr. Agata Karska from the Nicolas Copernicus uh, University of Torun. Okay, uh, that's not going to be a question, but uh, I think a comment. Uh, I think on behalf of all the, uh, members of different universities here, I, I, I really would like to thank you for this constructive comments, which we hear, and this, you know, outside view. Uh, myself, I will have to think about them for a longer time, but uh, I think this is really valuable that we also have this soft coaching and, and this, you know, uh, second part of your participation is th in this process and I really think it's valuable and something to continue. And also meeting here, I think we, we all benefited from shared coffee breaks, lunches and dinners. That's, that's really fantastic. Um, I would like to sh uh, add one more risk, which is perhaps more internal Polish risk that I see uh, and I hope we can somehow accommodate that. And that is the possible loss of mon momentum in this whole implementation if we get, once we get the results of the evaluation of, of Polish uh, universities uh, next year, uh, there's a big change in the rules. Uh, we'll see what will be the effect. Uh, but there's a risk that some of the top 20 or 21 universities uh, sitting here uh, will not meet the criteria for the next round of the EDUP competition for six, in six years. Uh, so, you know, this is something that my older colleagues uh, actually made me realize at the university that if we fail in, you know, one or two disciplines to, to meet this criteria, and we have many disciplines that will be evaluated, we won't be even able to participate in the next competition. And this way, you know, the ambitions and, and you know, this, this drive to implement all what we promised might be worsened. Something that uh, I think is, uh, you know, uh, important to discuss, perhaps, and how to also prepare for that. Uh, and, and one way of preparing, which I think would be very, very good, and m maybe you could consider this uh, also as part of evaluation next time, uh, would be to implement more uh, what we promised in our proposals and what we are doing in the strategies of the universities. This is something quite obvious, but it takes time. Uh, and, and of course, the strategy of the university, which has this also well-spelled operational goals and measures, would be something that would, uh, you know, keep the plans that we had uh, for long term uh, and something that uh, I think uh, we could improve at many universities and perhaps some scheme for that would be very useful. So I, I'm happy to hear what are your comments on, on these ideas. Thanks a lot for, for all this effort. Thank you. I think I will invite my, my colleagues also to comment, but first I can say um, 
To be honest, we don't know even if we are involved in the evalu evaluation. So it, 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 who will know um, what happens? I think that uh, we can trust the ministry and the government that they will follow the implementation plan. There will be a midterm e evaluation in due course, and, uh, and this will follow the criteria of the program. And I also think we can trust that, that uh, I, at least I have the feeling that the government is very uh, satisfied with its own decision to involve international peers in this process. So I'm sure you can expect a, a similar process for the midterm evaluation and, the, and uh, later on also uh, to, to have colleagues, peers from the rest of Europe uh, involved. Uh, I, I guess this is a, a very positive feature for, for you and, and also for the government and for the, the system. Um, I, get, I think that if I, were, if I was in the leadership of one of the, of the 20 universities, I would do all I could to in, integrate uh, the, the, the new ways of, of doing our daily business into the core of the university's activity. Because if we maintain it as something add-on, then the risk uh, for these activities to be sustained are much smaller. Maybe in the beginning you have to, to look at it as add-on activities, something you can do because you have new resources. But you should, in your plan, I guess, try to integrate it um, which means that something else might be changed. Um, we have heard that in, maybe in general 80% of, of your general budget is fi would, it's fixed cost. Um, one should always try to not let the fixed cost grow. Um, and also I think I should say that if you are not operating in, in a fixed a budget envelope. It's possible for Polish science to attract other resources, not only European resources, but I'm thinking of your fantastic uh, medical schools in Poland. Uh, some of them have uh, very interesting um, bio databases. Uh, I, f I can tell from my own university for many years we had more money uh, from international money from outside of Europe than from the EU. And uh, because uh, of our um, uh, medical research system, we got many resources from the NIH and other, other sources in the United States. And I'm, not sure, I'm sure that the medical sector in Poland has a fantastic opportunity to compete much more globally than it does today. Of course, it hinges on, on linguistic things. So, so, I mean, you are moving outside of, 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 of doing uh, too much in Polish. <laughs> uh, it, I, I know it's not so nice to say, but, but my mother tongue is not English. And we have had exactly the same discussion. If you want to, to break into the world, you have to communicate with it. But I don't know if some of my colleagues would uh, comment on your comments. <laughs> yeah, maybe, can I start, Lawrence? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Maybe Ulrich. to the last point, that, uh, I had the impression that this morning um, Anna Butsanovska, from the, the secretary from the ministry, was very clear in saying that they are following the lines of this excellence initiative. So I, I would be surprised if there is another competition which uh, can possibly uh, throw you out or something like that and uh, so I think that it's what she said is that you have to to be the best you have to be very good in in your strategic approach and I hope that this is that I understood that right and that the ministry is following that so you don't have to fear that that would probably be a parallel pro process and I hope that is not true and I, Lawrence, I wanted to, to shortly comment to the question of uh, federation or merging because you raised that question and came back to it. Um, um, there are probably sometimes the need for mergers. And I think that 
can be very good also to be a powerful big university but on the other side i think uh, my experience also or the german experience is that if you um, start from the scratch and merge it, it takes a lot of time and it will kind of slow your process down very much so i think the way would be to have good and functioning federations and then in a, in a, in a second step think about a merge because otherwise you are uh, you are blocked for quite a while with a, with a really complicated process of putting the administration together. So I would be a little careful in making too fast of a merge, but um, I also know that merges can be very successful. So it, it's a balance again. So that was my comment to that point. Other, co other questions or comments? Before we move into the closing, please. Remarks. We we do have one. Stasha Kistrin, Jagiellonian University. So first, uh, I join Agata in thanking you for your constant support for our uh, for our changes. This is really very important for us. And um, now let me express. Uh, my fear. It it's, uh, was suggested by Siebold. Um, well, we are optimistic in the sense that uh, as long as current minister um, uh, is supervising us, we are pretty safe. But, uh, well, the changes in the politics are quick, and therefore, uh, when, uh, and we are expecting changes, uh, therefore, I would really like to n ask you, the Board of International Experts, that even uh, in the very worst case that uh, something changes in the policy of supporting uh, financially the uh, well, EDUP initiative, I, c I could imagine that it could be, well, for a year because of economic situation uh, limited or frozen. But if it would come to the situation that it is stopped completely by whatever reason, uh, simultaneously, not because of a total drop of, uh, or a breakdown of economics, but if the, then we have the, um, as a means to support any other social programs, then for us at the universities it would be extremely difficult to persuade uh, our colleagues to continue whatever we have started even in, in, in this initiative. It will be, well, strong disappointment. And, uh, and that is what I would like to uh, ask you, that even in this very worst situation, please, uh, please volunteer with your support for these changes in Poland. So that is my, well, supplication, if you wish. Thank you. Well, you, you, you will have noticed over time that we have come as colleagues and friends and it is the uh, trademark of collegiality and friendship that it doesn't stop in hardship yes i think uh, this is not an evaluation uh, it this is uh, a conference where we are all exchanging ideas and taking a little bit stock, but we have promised to write one or two pages to the Ministry of our impressions, and I think that, uh, of course, we will. I think we will find some uh, wording uh, saying that it's very important to continue or to 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 continue such an initiative because of the long-term perspective of whatever you have embarked on and personally I, I definitely agree that if the, if this program came to a, a stop then it's a lost opportunity for the next generation almost because uh, um, people don't forget uh, easily uh, and it has it is a big effort for all of you and and I'm I'm sure the ministry knows that um, but still the poli political climate can change and I the economy of a country can change uh, dramatically because of the pandemic or, or whatever. But we will do our best in, uh, of course we will always maintain our friendship and whenever we have a chance to uh, speak on your behalf 
Um, but sometimes that would not be enough, <laughs> to, for even if, if we would like to, to, to say you, the, money, the, the economy should continue to, as planned, it's not in our power. Um, maybe we should go into the last uh, part of, of uh, the conference closing remarks. I guess that this is meant as Oh, there's still more questions. That's fine. We, we do uh, have one more question. We have uh, yeah, Would time. you be so kind and approach the mic that you choose? Thank you. Arek Voice, Wrocław University of Science and Technology. Another question, there's one thank you. It was brought by several of you experts, uh, as far as I understood, that the uh, mission of the, the idea of this whole endeavor is not just to select the best universities or even to make them advance in the rankings or improve on citations, but also to uh, put certain prestige and then responsibility on us to address civilizational challenges and other responsibilities like formation of graduates, so that maybe with time we will get even a stronger um, position in Poland to affect politics, to affect uh, um, sort of like in Academia Europea with the program SAPEA that you might want to address. So it means uh, informing policy by research, by science, and also uh, maybe eventually to earn a little bit bigger funding for the science and education in Poland in general. So maybe this, this, this program will start something that's much bigger than just selecting the best universities. Thank you. That, that would be great. Uh, would you react to that? No, I think we, uh, we are fully in agreement that mm -hmm. we, we are Actually, I personally am very optimistic because it, it's obvious for anybody who would look at Poland, and I'm sure your government is also looking at Poland, it's their job, that, that this is a successful program. And so it's bad leadership to close the best programs you have. And so if we have any trust in, in the political environment, then of course they would also understand this within their limitations. So, so I, think, I think you should be rather safe, but still. Uh, uh, but I also agree that the, the, the benefit of the program is not necessarily the extra resources. It's the change of mood, it's the change of practices within each university. Uh, because whatever happens to the resources, the universities do have uh, rather large resources compared to, to many other um, institutions in, in, in the country. And, and you have gained a lot of autonomy under the new law that you, and, and opportunities to, to change practices that you did not have, have four years ago. So we should not forget that the new law is there, and the universities are taking this as a, on as an opportunity. So it, uh, the, the excellent program is one program, but not the only uh, direction that the university can look. Sure, but, but it, it's great to be hopeful, and I honestly don't see um, many reasons not to be. And I really very much agree with uh, one of our experts and one of our guests, so uh, Professor Simon Gaskell, uh, who mentioned in uh, the previous panel that uh, sometimes during the, the later parts of conferences, we tend to go into more and more detail. And we still need to remember that great atmosphere of enthusiasm that has really been part of this conference, and I uh, wholeheartedly believe that it will uh, keep uh, to be uh, as optimistic. And uh, this uh, panel is actually one, one another example of the great spirit, uh, for which I'd like to thank all of our guests. Uh, Professor Ulrike uh, Beisigel, thank you for all of your great input, and, and it really was a pleasure to be in your company for the last uh, 24 hours or more. Yes.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Simon Gaskell. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Josef Palinkas. It is a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Siebold Norda. And a tremendous uh, thank you to Professor Loris Holm Nielsen for all hard work. And, and I'm glad in the times uh, when we travel much less, you've still made the choice to come here. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you as often as possible. Thank you.